Now what we need to understand is this, what the relationship of Jesus Christ to the church truly is. Don't think of the church as a business with Jesus as the president. The church is a body with Jesus as the head. Do you see the difference? In today's fast-paced, self-focused world, it's difficult to find quality biblical teaching, much less teaching that simplifies profound truth so that it can be applied to your own life. For over 50 years, Adrian Rogers brought that kind of profound truth, simply stated, to each of his messages. Join us now for this study from God's Word. And if you're encouraged by today's message, remember you can stream this message again and download outlines, notes, a transcript, and other resources to go along with this message, all at lwf.org. Now, let's join Adrian Rogers. Would you be finding Luke chapter 7? Luke chapter 7. And when you found it, look up here, and may I tell you again that you could discover no greater truth than the marvelous, wonderful truth of kingdom authority. You could enjoy no greater blessing than to enter into the truth of kingdom authority. But having said that, we have many, and some of them in this church today, who are living defeated lives. Somebody has described our generation this way. We are a needy generation, sick of our conditions, unable to create better, too ignorant to explain life, too shallow to endure it, too bitter to enjoy it, and too weak to overcome it. I hope that's not you. But it could be you, but it need not be you if you will discover a wonderful truth called kingdom authority. Now let's look in Luke chapter 7, verse 1. And when he had ended all these sayings in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum. And a certain centurion's servant who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. And when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this. For he loveth our nation, and he hath built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them. And when he was now not far from the house of the centurion, or not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I'm not worthy that thou shouldest enter under my roof. Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee. But say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. For I also am a man set under authority. Now, I want you to understand this verse is the key verse. For I also am a man set under authority, having under me soldiers. And I say unto one, Go, and he goeth. And to another, Come, and he cometh. And to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and turned him about, and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, that I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. Now, ladies and gentlemen, look up here just parenthetically before I go one step further. If Jesus Christ marveled at this man, I mean absolutely marveled at him, if Jesus Christ was astounded by what this man said, then you ought to take note of it. And if Jesus Christ said of all of the sons of Abraham that he knew that this man had more faith than any he'd met. Don't you think you ought to pay attention? Hmm? Now, folks, we're dealing with something that is significant. Don't miss that. Don't miss what the Lord Jesus said. He said, uh, I'll read verse 9 again. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him 
and turned him about and said to the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And they that were sent returning to the house found the servant whole that had been sick. Now, again, I want to say that Satan, that sinister minister of misinformation, will do all that he can do to keep you from learning the truth of your kingdom authority in the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants to pull the veil of darkness over this truth. Now, the Lord did not create you, bring you into this world to be a victim of Satan for you to live a crushed and defeated life. To the contrary, our Lord expects you to reign, as we're going to see, not someday in the sweet by and by, but right now in the nasty now and now. You are to have victory over Satan in this day and in this age. Now, let's back up again. We're talking about the principles of kingdom authority. And remember that when God created Adam and Eve, God created Adam and Eve, put them on earth, and the Bible says in the book of Genesis that God told them to have dominion. Dominion, that means they're to reign. They're to rule. They were the king and queen of this earth. But they disobeyed God. They yielded everything to Satan. They lost their dominion. They lost their crown. Rather than having dominion, they became slaves of Satan. They became servants to Satan. And when Adam rebelled against heaven, Adam lost his authority on earth. And Adam became a slave to Satan, and a child of a slave is a slave also. And therefore, all of those who are in Adam became slaves of Satan. But the Lord Jesus Christ came to this earth, the last Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, won back for us the victory that the first Adam lost, and we were able to sing together as a congregation, Oh, victory in Jesus. Now, we need to understand this because if we don't understand it, no matter how true it may be, it'll do us no good whatsoever. There was an emancipation proclamation when Abraham Lincoln set the slaves free in the South. They were free, set free. And thank God for that. But did you know that many slaves continued on the plantation? Many continued to serve their old master. Why? Two reasons. One, some of them didn't get the news. Secondly, some of them couldn't believe it. It seemed too good to be true. And I tell you, there's some people in this world today who have not yet gotten the news of our, of our emancipation in the Lord Jesus Christ and of our kingdom authority and to others. And some in this place right now, it will seem too good to be true. Now, we often hear people say, oh, the truth will set you free. Well, be careful. The truth doesn't set you free if you don't know the truth, if you don't know it. What did our Lord Jesus say about that? In John 8, verse 31, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are ye disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, what I'm trying to do in this, uh, in this series of messages is to help you to know the truth. Now, we're not talking about overcoming Satan in the world to come. We're talking about now where you work this afternoon and tomorrow morning. You see, we lost it in Adam. We got it back in Christ. Here's a key verse. Put this one in your margin. Romans chapter 5 and verse 17. It sums up everything that I'm trying to say. For by one man's offense, death reigned by one. Who was that one man who offended? Adam. Who took over then? Death. Death reigned because of Adam's offense and because of Adam's sin. 
much more, and thank God for that much more now, they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Shall reign in life. Not reigning somewhere, but right now. As I say, not just in the sweet by and by. Now here's the story. There's a man, a centurion. That means he was an army officer. He had 100 men under his command at his post. He was a very important man in the Roman army. He was a Gentile. And he had a servant that was sick and he was concerned about his servant. His servant was about to die. People came to Jesus and said, this is a good man. You ought to go over there and help him. He was servant. So Jesus is going to this man's house and the man sends out a message. He says, listen, I didn't feel that I was worthy to come to you. I don't, I, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. But he said, all you have to do is to give the command and my servant will be healed. And then he explained why he said that. He said, for I too, I also am a man set under authority. That is, I have officers over me. I'm a centurion, but there's a general over me. And over that general is the emperor. I understand that I am under authority. Therefore, I have authority. Therefore, I can say to this servant, Go, and he goes. I can say to this soldier, come, and he comes. Why? Because I am under authority, and because I am under authority, I am over these who are under me. Simple, that's the way it works. He was a military man. He understood the way things worked in the military. And when he said that, Jesus marveled. He said, he's got it. He has seen it. He understands it. Why can't even the children of Israel understand this? I haven't seen faith like this in all the land of Israel. He understands kingdom authority. And Jesus marveled. Now you need to understand today this same kingdom authority. What do we mean by authority? It means the official legal right to act. Now, we're going to learn four things today about kingdom authority that come out of this text, okay? And, and, and I don't want this to be academic. I want to go beyond academics into your life. Now, first of all, the source of kingdom authority. All authority comes from a higher power. It comes down. Authority comes from above. You have to be under authority to have authority. I also am a man set under authority. That's what he says there in verse 8. For I also am a man set under. Authority comes from above. Therefore, any authority that you may hold is no better or stronger than the one who is over you. Because you see, you have to have someone to back up the authority that you hold. When a policeman comes and knocks on the door, there's been a disturbance. He knocks on the door, and the person behind the door may say, who's there? And the policeman will say, open the door in the name of the law. In the name of the law. Know that we're to pray what? In the name of Jesus. Open the door in the name of the law. Now, what this man is doing is just appealing to a higher authority. Now, he doesn't just come and say, this is John Jones, would you please open the door? Open the door in the name of the law. Well, where does he get this authority? Well, he's a policeman. He's been commissioned. So behind that badge is the police department of the city. Well, suppose the man doesn't want the police department of the city to interfere with him. Well, behind the police department of the city is the state militia. Well, suppose he won't obey that. Behind that is the National Guard, the forces of the United States if there comes to be a, an insurrection. That one man is backed up by incredible authority. 
And that's what we need to understand, that that authority comes from above. Now, the reason that God's children have authority is because of the Lord that is over them. Now, let me give you another great verse that'll help you understand this. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 17. I'm going to take just a phrase out of that verse. Don't turn to it, but jot it down. As he is, talking about Jesus, as he is, so are we, now here's the key phrase, in this world. As Jesus is, so are we. Because we are in him and he is in us. This is the doctrine of identification. When he died, he died for us, and so we died with him, right? His death had your name on it. He died for you. You died with him. Are you identified with him in his death? Say amen. Okay. Now, secondly, when he rose, you rose with him. You are identified, united with him in resurrection. The Bible says if we've been buried in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Jesus died for us, and then Jesus rose for us. He, he died for us, he gave himself for us, and then he rose to give himself to us. And so we have resurrection life. Now when Jesus ascended, we ascended with him. And the Bible teaches that we're seated with the Lord Jesus in the heavenlies, far above all principalities and powers. And so therefore, Jesus' victory is our victory. Understand this, that the authority comes from Jesus, and we are united with Jesus in his death, burial, resurrection, ascension, enthronement, and therefore we sing victory in Jesus. Does Jesus have dominion over Satan? Does Jesus have authority over demons? Are you in Jesus? Yes. That's the point. It flows from above. If they're subject to him, they must be subject to us. Now, that doesn't mean that you're somebody important. It's him. As he is, so are we in this world. I heard about a man one time who was boasting about taking his pocket knife and cutting the tail off a monstrous lion. Somebody said, wow, you are brave. If you cut his tail off, why didn't you just go ahead and cut his head off too? Oh, he said, somebody had already done that. <laughs> you see, friend, Jesus is the one who has cut the head off that lion of hell. And because of what he has done, because of his victory, then we have victory in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what we need to understand is this, what the relationship of Jesus Christ to the church truly is. Don't think of the church as a business with Jesus as the president. The church is a body with Jesus as the head. Do you see the difference? That is, we are organically related to the Lord Jesus Christ. His life is in us. Our authority comes from the Lord Jesus. And that's the reason when Jesus gave the great commission in Matthew 28 and sent us out to spread the gospel, he said, Of all authority is given unto me, go ye therefore. Therefore, because I have this authority, and now I am giving you the power of attorney to act for me. Here's a great verse, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 22. It speaks of Jesus who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. First point, first truth, the source of kingdom authority. It flows from above. It comes from a higher power. Now, that brings us to the secret of kingdom authority. That's the second thing, the secret of kingdom authority. Look again in verse 8. For I also am a man set under authority, having under me soldiers. I'm under, so I have people under me. Here's the secret. It's very plain. It's very wonderful. You cannot be over until you are under. You cannot have authority 
until you get under the authority that is over you. Now, that's so simple, but it's so wonderful. You see, all authority is linked to obedience. Why would a person give you authority to act for him when you're disobedient to him? That's the reason that Satan endeavored to get Adam to disobey. When Adam disobeyed, he forfeited his authority. Now, our generation doesn't like the word authority. We don't like to be under anybody. I mean, we talk, stick out our chest. We talk about being free-born Americans. And if you're a baby boomer, well, you, <laughs> you know, let, let me tell you, if, if you're part of the, the boomer generation, you are the first television generation. For you, the television was a third parent. Uh, in your lifetime, you've gone through the hula hoop, the Barbie doll, pop psychology, Dr. Spock. Many of you have Spock-marked kids. <laughs> Donahue, rock and roll. You watched Elvis Presley wear his clothes out from the inside. <laughs> the Beatles. And all of that music that you boomers listen to, all of it had a defiant message. It was anti-authority. The authority was called the man. You were told to resist the man. And authority figures were made fun of. Fathers were Archie Bunker. Preachers were Flip Wilson. To be laughed at. And the, the, the ideas that were in your generation was this, I got to be me. Frankie said, I did it my way. McDonald's or whomever says, have it your way. Do your thing. If it feels good, do it. And many of us dare not realize the vestiges of rebellion that still lurk down in our hearts. We don't want to submit to authority. And you're looking at a guy by nature is the same way. I was looking for a parking place a while back and I saw a sign that said, don't even think about parking here. <laughs> I was so full of rebellion, I thought about it. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, I, I, I mean, we all have that thing in us. We don't want anybody to be over us. But God does not give kingdom authority to rebels. God does not give kingdom authority to rebels. I've often used this illustration. Have you ever tried to teach a child to drive? How many of you have ever tried to teach somebody to drive? Child, anybody else? What's the first thing you showed them? Not even the ignition switch, certainly not the accelerator, not how to put it in drive. The very first thing, if you've got an iota, a modicum of intelligence, the brake. Honey, here's how you make it stop. Here's how you make it stop. There's the brake. Now, suppose that child that you're teaching, that young teenager says, hey, Dad, don't, I'm not interested in the brake. Show me how to make this thing go. I'm not interested in the break. That is of no importance to me. You just find yourself taking the keys and putting them back in your pocket. <laughs> Isn't that right? Because you know if that person is not interested in how to make it stop, you're not interested in telling him how to make it go. Isn't that right? And I'm going to tell you this about God the Holy Spirit. If you do not know the restraint of the Spirit, you will never know the release of the Spirit. If you cannot operate the spiritual brakes, God will never show you the spiritual accelerator. You see, the reason that many people do not have kingdom authority is they have not learned how to be under and therefore they will not be over. Now, God has authority everywhere. There's the authority of the Word of God. Are you under? There's the authority of the Lordship of Christ. Have you submitted to it? There's the authority of the direction of the Holy Spirit. Do you know it? There's to be authority in the home, as we're going to see later on. There's authority in the church. There is authority in the government. There is authority everywhere. When you go to a restaurant, there's authority in that restaurant. 
I was with some preachers, some friends. It was a convention. Well, we went into a restaurant. We wanted to be together. You know how preachers like to get together and talk. And, and we went in the restaurant, and uh, there was not enough room for us to get around one table. So I said, uh, well, let's put these two tables together. A waitress came up, said, Mr., you can't do that. Now, folks, there was no reason I couldn't have done that. Made perfectly good sense. We were not blocking an aisle. It was good for business. Had I been the manager of the restaurant, I would have certainly acquiesced to that. I knew that waitress didn't understand. And after all, I am the pastor of Bellevue Baptist Church. <laughs> and she's a waitress. Now, I want to say this in all seriousness. There are no big shots in the kingdom of heaven. And my thought was, oh, yeah, we can do it. That's all right, ma'am. It, it won't matter. And to start to put those tables together. You know what God said to me? God said, Adrian, you're a rebel. She's in charge here. And he was right. And I had to just say, well, we won't do it. We won't do it. There's authority everywhere. Everywhere. And I'm going to tell you this. If you do not learn to be under, you will not be over. And I'll give you the best example of this whole thing. And, and this humbled me when I found out, listen, the Lord Jesus Christ was under authority. What did that man say? He looked at Jesus and he said, I also am a man under authority. He said, you're under authority. You say, well, to whom was Jesus under authority? I'm going to show you. Now, remember that Jesus came here as a man. He showed us not what God was to be like on earth. He showed us what man was to be like on earth. He was God, but he, he lived a life on this earth as man. And as a man, he was subject to his father. John 4, 17, verse 4, I have glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. That's what Jesus said to his father. Jesus was in subje subjection to the Holy Spirit. Luke 4, verse 1, the Bible says, he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, subject to the Holy Spirit. He was subject to the Word of God. He said the Scriptures cannot be broken. He was subject to his earthly parents. Put this verse down, Luke chapter 2, verse 51. He went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. That's to his mother and father, his earthly mother, and uh, Joseph, who was not his true father, but his father on this earth. The Lord Jesus was subject to earthly government. When there came time to pay taxes, what did Jesus say in Matthew 17, verse 27? Notwithstanding, lest we should offend them, go thou to the sea and cast an hook and take up the fish that first cometh up. And when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money that take and give unto them for me and thee. Jesus, the King of glory, paid his taxes. Point. If Jesus Christ is subject to God the Father, the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, if Jesus Christ were subject to earthly parents, if Jesus Christ were subject to the government under which he lived and operated, who are we to say nobody's going to tell us what to do? That army officer looked at Jesus Christ and he said, I also am a man under authority. Now, the secret of kingdom authority is plain and clear. You cannot be over unless you're willing to be under. Now, here's the third thing. We have, talked about, we have talked about the source of this authority. Authority flows from above. We've talked about the secret of this authority. Because it flows from above, we must get under that authority that is over us so we can be over those things that that authority has set us over. Got it? Got it? All right, now here's the third thing. The scope of kingdom authority. And to what, what realms does this authority extend? Well, it is to the things of the Spirit of God. You're in Luke 7. Just turn over to Luke chapter 10 and look in verse 19. 
Well, let's start in verse 18 because I like that. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and on scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Now, if you have a King James like I'm reading from, the word power is used twice, but they're two different words. And it may be translated this way, Behold, I give you authority over all the power of the enemy. Now, what is, what is the scope, therefore, of our authority? It is over all the power of the enemy. Now, we need to be very careful here, and I want you to listen. Listen carefully now. Because kingdom authority does not need to be refused, but it certainly doesn't need to be confused, and it certainly doesn't need to be abused. Now, what is the scope of kingdom authority? Learn this, when God gave Adam authority over the beast of the field, the fowls of the air, and the fish of the sea, that authority has not yet been given to us. We do not live in the Garden of Eden. Now, potentially, potentially, we gain more in Christ than we ever lost in Adam. But our full inheritance is waiting until Jesus Christ comes again. Adam was given authority over the forces of nature. You and I are given authority over the power of the enemy. Have you got that? I hope you understand that. Because, you see, the dominion over the forces of nature, that will come in the millennium. Hebrews 2.8 is a key verse here. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. He's talking about man. For in that he put all in subjection under him, that is, under man, he left nothing that is not yet put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. That is, there is a potentiality that is yet to be fulfilled. There is a not yet. Romans 8, verse 22, the Bible says there, we know that the whole creation uh, groaneth and prevaileth in pain until now. Look around. This is not the Garden of Eden. There's desert, disease, destruction, depravity all over the globe. And if you're a child of God, you're not isolated nor insulated from these. Romans 8, verse 23 says, And not only they, but ourselves which also have the firstfruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of the body. Now, the restoration of nature and the redemption of the body, that's out yonder. We see not yet all things put under him. But in this day and in this age, he says, I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy. That is the scope of your kingdom authority. Now you say, Adrian, why are you just, why, why are you slowing down here? I'm just trying to help you to understand how it works. You may be spirit-filled, but don't throw a rock in a hornet's nest. It won't do you any good to be spirit-filled when those hornets come out of there. That's what I'm trying to say. When our Lord says He gives you authority, He's talking about spiritual authority. He's not saying that you have authority over microbes, mosquitoes, mildew, or mudslides. Now, now, why do, you have, why do you have to understand that? Because if the devil cannot keep you from learning this truth, he'll try to corrupt it and pervert it and have you have the idea that if you have spiritual authority, you can make it rain. Or if you have spiritual authority, that you can walk in a hospital room and empty it. No, you can't. We have these joy boys on television who've taken this truth and they have so distorted this truth that they would have you to believe that kingdom authority is the key to Fort Knox and the fountain of youth rolled into one. It's the gospel of cash, Cadillacs, and comfort, but it's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, Behold, I give you authority over all of the power of the enemy. 2 Peter 1 verse 3 according as his divine power, that is, his divine authority, hath given up unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. 
Now that's where your authority is. By His divine power, He has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. I give you authority over all the power of the enemy. One day, yes. One day, the lamb and the lion will lie down together. One day, yes, the desert will blossom as a rose. One day, yes, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as waters that cover the sea. But Hebrews tells us, not yet. But in the meanwhile, we are not Satan's lackeys. We are not slaves of sin. Satan has no power, no authority. Sin has no allurement. Temptation has no power that the child of God cannot overcome with kingdom authority. That's the scope of it. We need to understand what the scope of this authority is. Now, here's the last thing I want you to notice. We're talking about some principles, and then as we go on in this series, we're going to flesh these out. We're going to see how it works in the church, how it works in the home, how it works in the government, how it works in society. But the, the fourth thing we're going to see is the strength of kingdom authority, the strength of it. This man said, just speak a word and my servant will be healed. Now, Jesus obviously had power to heal that you and I uh, may not have unless God gives us that very special gift. But the point that I'm emphasizing right now is that this man who was a centurion was a man of strength. That is, he said, I have those who are under me. Go back again, if you will, and look in verse 8. For I also am a man set under authority, having under me soldiers. And I say to one, go, and he goeth. Would you like some soldiers to fight for you? And to another, come, and he cometh. And to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. How would you like some spiritual soldiers and some spiritual servants? All right, if you need, if you need spiritual soldiers and spiritual servants, you need this strength then you are going to have to enter into a thing called surrender. Do you know where strength comes from in the Christian life? Surrender. Surrender. Several years ago, we had a, the mayor's prayer breakfast. There was a man named Kerry H. Humphreys who was the speaker. Now, who's Kerry Humphreys? He's the president of Cargill, North America. Well, what is cargo? At that time, and I don't know, it still may be, it was the largest private holding company in America, perhaps in the world. Now, if you're a businessman, you know that this man was not in the world of business a five or six, he's a ten. This was Kerry Humphreys. And Kerry Humphreys is a committed Christian. I heard him tell how he gave his life to Jesus Christ. And I heard him testify of the change that came into his life. And then he said this. He said, I do not try to set a fashion statement. He said, I don't emphasize style in the way that I dress. But he said, every morning when I go out, he said, I put a white handkerchief in my pocket. He said, it's up there right now. He said, that white handkerchief is not there primarily for style. That white handkerchief is there to say something to me. He said, that white handkerchief is a sign of surrender. And he said this, and I wrote it down. He said, in 1961, I surrendered my all to Jesus Christ. This white handkerchief is a reminder each day that I am His to command. Now, folks, that's a man who has all of these people working under him. I mean, that is a, that's a man that is a mogul, a magnate in business, but he's also a man who is a humble man who said, I am his to command. Have you said that to Jesus Christ? Do you mean it? then if you do, you're going to understand this tremendous strength. You see, there's a difference in authority and power. 
Authority comes from the office. Power is residual in the person. Here's an illustration we can all understand, then I'll be finished. Professional football players, they have become monstrous. When I played football in college and high school, I weighed about 185 pounds, and I was one of the bigger men in the backfield. Today, they wouldn't let me carry the water. <laughs> These guys are something. I mean, here's a, here's a fellow. He is six feet seven. He weighs 285 pounds, and he's quick as a cat. And on top of that, he's got a helmet, a face guard, all of his armor all around him. Good night, that big. You could get hurt playing that game. <laughs> and yet there's another fellow out there. This guy may be 155 pounds. He has no helmet. He has no shoulder pads. He's wearing a shirt with stripes on it. And all he's got is a whistle. And he says to that guy, you get off the field and go to the showers. Power, authority. See the difference? The guy with the whistle, the guy with the striped shirts, he's the one with the authority. And Jesus says to us, we're the little guy. I give you authority over the, all the power of the enemy. He's the big guy. And it's time you and I told him to take a hike. It's time you and I understood the strength of spiritual authority. Now, just knowing it is not enough. We need to learn how to pray with authority, and we're going to be talking about that soon and very soon. But let's go back to Mr. Humphreys, who said, I gave my heart to Jesus Christ in 1961. It was very real to him. Have you given your heart to Jesus Christ? I say, have you? I didn't ask if you were Baptist. I didn't ask if you're a member of Bellevue. I'm asking this, are you saved and do you know that you're saved? Bow your heads in prayer. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that many right now will receive him into their hearts. Holy Spirit of God, open understandings. Draw people to Jesus. O oh Lord, may people say an everlasting yes by faith to you. Lord, I know that you said if anyone would come to you, you would never turn them away. And while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, would you say, Lord, come into my heart right now. I receive you by faith and give me the courage to make it public. Amen. Well, amen. Thank God for these in this beautiful worship center who have prayed and asked Christ to come into their heart. And many of you may have done the same thing. Here's the wonderful news. The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And friend, that includes you. And if you prayed with us and asked Christ to save you, would you write us and let us know so we can rejoice? And we'll send you some literature to help you to get started in your Christian life. We hope that today's message has been an encouragement to you as we've studied God's Word together. For more resources from Adrian Rogers, including copies or downloads of this message, as well as Pastor Rogers' outline, notes, or a complete transcript of this message, please visit our website, lwf.org. You can also check out the complete series available through our online store. At lwf.org, you can also sign up to receive our new daily heartbeat email. 
Each heartbeat contains a daily scripture and devotional thought from Adrian Rogers, an inspirational 90-second treasure from the Word, as well as a link to our daily radio program, all in one place, delivered directly to your computer or mobile device each morning. And if you're looking for some inspiration or encouragement to get you through the week, check us out on social media at LWF Ministries. Join us next time as we continue this powerful series of messages from Adrian Rogers. Thanks for joining us for today's program. We'll see you next time. In a world obsessed with power, the Bible reveals the most awesome power of all, the power of kingdom authority. The good news is that this power is available to every believer today. Written by renowned pastor and author Adrian Rogers, the incredible power of kingdom authority will help you to establish God's authority in your life. Learn to appropriate God's authority in spiritual battles and live under God's authority in your home and church. The incredible power of kingdom authority is a great companion piece to our current message series. And as a thank you for your gift this month, we'd love to send you a copy. Request the book when you call with a gift at 1-800-647-9400 or give online at lwf.org. Get an upper hand on the underworld with the incredible power of kingdom authority by Adrian Rogers. Call or go online today. Adrian Rogers had two great passions, introducing people to Jesus Christ and an abiding love for God's Word. That's why we're excited to announce that this summer, the Adrian Rogers Legacy Bibles will be back in stock and available for purchase. Now featuring large print and red lettering, this NKJV Bible includes sermon notes, Adrianisms, and treasures from the LWF archives. Call 1-800-647-9400 or go online to lwf.org.